Vielen Dank, Larry. So that was German, by the way. <laughs> well, it's, uh, my dear friends, it's been a privilege to be with you, shake hands with many of you, and I feel the spirit and the wonderful spirit you have for this great university and for the causes it stands for. Thank you for extending this invitation for me to be with you on this uh, beautiful and storied campus. We walked briefly out there to take make some photos, and I envy those students who are privileged to study here. It is indeed a joy and privilege to be among friends, distinguished guests, and so many people of goodwill who have made this evening possible. In particular, I would recognize again, as has been before, uh, Provost Quick, Dean Sony, Dr. Meeks, Dr. Eastland, whose efforts, among many others, have been so instrumental in establishing the John A. Witzel Symposium and Chair in LA Studies. I'm, and I enjoyed very much tonight on the table meeting Ed Roski and his uh, dear wife. What a wonderful group of supporters you have in this uh, marvelous school. I'm grateful to see descendants of Elder Witzel. I read many of his books. I just looked at a couple of them in German. I'm honored to be with you tonight among people who believe that what we have in common is of greater significance than that which divides us. The effort to throw off traditions of distrust and pittiness and truly see one another with new eyes, see each other not as aliens or adversaries, but as fellow travelers, brothers and sisters, and children of God, is one of the most challenging, while at the same time most rewarding and ennobling experiences of our human existence. I commend the University of Southern California for its desire to advance dialogue in religious studies and for this effort to seek out commonalities and discover shared values among people. Now, Dr. John A. Witzel was asked to fulfill that assignment. Actually, after a long uh, time he spent in Europe, he was actually happy to be back in, in Utah, and here he was coming, and he came with an open heart and with a great desire. Church population in Brother Witzel's day was primarily centered in the Western United States. Today, more than half of LDS church members live outside the US and Canada. In fact, members of the church reside in 190 countries and speak 123 different languages. We have 80,000 missionaries in the field worldwide. 55 different languages are taught to our missionaries, and they really love the countries they go to. They come back as the greatest ambassadors for those countries. As the church expands, so too does the need for new meeting houses, and the church today is building them at a rate of two each week. Eighty years ago, the church was more insular concerned primarily with the well-being of its own members. This was particularly true during the immediately after the difficult years of the Great Depression when so many throughout the world were struggling to survive. Nevertheless, it was during that trying time that the Mormon Church Welfare Program emerged, and some of you had the privilege to see that in Salt Lake City uh, firsthand. As a part of this program, the church created farms, ranches, and orchards that produce everything from bread to cheese to peanut butter to jam to pasta. Each year, members of the church volunteer four and a half million hours working on farms in canneries and storehouses to produce needed items for those who are in distress. These items end up in 135 bishops' storehouses, small grocery stores, so to speak, where the commodities are freely distributed by our bishops to families and individuals in need. 
It is said that the food in these bishops' storehouses is the best food that money cannot buy. <laughs> in addition, the church has established more than 100 domestic employment offices and has established thrift stores called Deseret Industries. In 42 locations, those who have difficulty finding or keeping a job receive individualized coaching and are surrounded with a support staff that helps them find employment. All this has happened since Ella Witzo explained Mormonism here at USC. Over the years, as the church and its members became more prosperous, they began to reach out in a great humanitarian effort to assist those of other faiths or of no faith at all. In the last 30 years, tens of thousands of church members have extended themselves in more than 180 countries of the world, engaging in humanitarian endeavors from providing wheelchairs to training medical personnel on how to deliver newborns safely, to assembling and distributing hygiene kits, to providing villages with clean water, especially in Africa, to funding and organizing immunizations, to teaching farmers on, and home gardeners how to grow more and healthier food. A familiar image in the wake of these disasters throughout the world is uh, of the ocean of church members in their yellow helping hands shirts who sacrifice their own comfort and time and reach out to those in distress where they may be. In the aftermath of a devastating hurricane in the south of the United States, the mayor of a Louisiana city gave the key to his city to the Mormon church. In the aftermath of a tornado in the Midwestern United States, one public official made a point of recognizing those organiza organizations that had been especially helpful in coming to the aid of those in distress. And he said, in particular, there are two groups I especially want to mention, the mayor said, the Latter-day Saints and the Mormons. <laughs> Today, the LAS Church connects cultures, nationalities, languages, and people of every socioeconomic status. It encourages people to be good citizens, to care for those who are in distress, to be kind to others, and to nurture and build loving, respectful families. Today, church members seek to create goodwill among people of all religious beliefs, political persuasions, and of every race. One of our Articles of Faith states, we claim the privilege of worshiping Almighty God according to the dictates of our own conscience and allow all men the same privilege. Let them worship how, where, or what they may. We Mormons know what it means to be a minority. Throughout our history, we have been discriminated against and persecuted as a result of our religious beliefs. More recently, we are experiencing the growing pains of becoming a majority in some areas, which creates its own challenges. In both cases, we understand that the rights of all men, whether they are in the minority or majority, must be preserved and safeguarded. Although we do not know what the coming years and decades will bring, we trust that because of our sincere beliefs and strong faith, members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints will be numbered among those who are a force for good and advocates for peace and brotherly love among all nations. That ends the infomercial. <laughs> now, for a long time, Harriet and I felt a need to visit Auschwitz, the Nazi concentration camp. And the site of brutal murders of millions during World War II. 
So recently, as the two of us were in Eastern Europe to be with our members there, we made a point of making a pilgrimage to Auschwitz. One cannot visit such a place without coming away from it changed. We walked along the same path that so many others had walked. One could almost see weary mothers holding the hands of terrified children, the hobbling steps of the elderly and the infirm, the despair in the eyes of those caught in a cold and terrible nightmare. In Auschwitz, one almost can see the immeasurable sadness in the eyes of those who understood what was about to happen. I can imagine them looking at one another, families, parents, loved ones, friends, and strangers, their eyes filled with fear, grief, and resignation. To this day, Harriet and I have a difficult time talking about our feelings in that place of unimaginable horror. In many ways, it's too painful to talk about. As I stood there, I wondered yet again, who could have done something like this? I had learned about the Holocaust and Auschwitz all my life. In Germany, this is not something that is talked about once every few years. It is addressed regularly. Harriet and I, our children, our grandchildren, all attended German schools that ensured that we understood the cruelty and inhumanity that happened during this time. So although I was not surprised by what I saw, at the same time, it all seemed so incomprehensible. How could anyone be so heartless and past feeling to do this? Who but a demon could do such evil? The commandant of Auschwitz for much of the time of this operation was Rudolf Höss, a man who grew up in a strict religious family. His father wanted him to enter the priesthood. But Rudolf abandoned the thought as he became immersed in politics. What kind of a person was he? Rudolf Höss described himself as gentle, good-natured, and very helpful. His daughter remembers him as the nicest man in the world. Later at Nuremberg, his defense rested on the fact that he was only following orders, that he was doing his duty. Rudolf Hess supervised the murders of perhaps millions of people. The first Jews to be executed at Auschwitz were from Upper Silesia. I was born in Ostrava, not far from Upper Silesia. I'm troubled to know that at the very time and at the very place when I was taking my first steps, soldiers from the Gestapo were rounding up terrified families and transporting them in railroad cars to that horrible place where they were destined to take their final steps. Although I was only a small child during the war, I still recognize that the actions of my people affected me and the entire world. They left an inexpressible sorrow and an inextinguishable agony that is still felt to this day throughout the world. As Harriet and I walked away from that place which has been hollowed by the blood of so many innocents, we felt changed. We were different. We had learned and relearned important lessons that we must never forget. Today, I wanted to speak about three insights, among many others, that forcibly entered my heart and mind on that day. The first insight, we had those who do not, 
whom we do not really know. As I reflect on what happened in Germany years ago, it breaks my heart to think of the hatred of my people towards those of the Jewish faith, the gypsies, the political opposition, and many other groups. That this hatred led to such horrific atrocities is something I still cannot completely understand. Historians, politicians, and sociologists have all attempted, attempted to explain what happened and why. And yet, how can one truly understand such evil? I'm convinced that one of the major reasons these atrocities happened is because it is human nature to be suspicious, envious, distrustful, and even hateful of those we do not really know. I suppose we are all guilty of this to one extent or another. Do we really know even our neighbors and colleagues, people we greet daily? Is it one of the most, isn't it one of the most disconcerting qualities of being human to distrust or dislike those who are different from us in a variety of elements? The great strategy is if only we could take the time to truly know the other person, we would discover that perhaps we are not so different at all. He who once was our enemy can become our friend. The church that I represent has two conferences, general conferences we call those, each year where members of the church assemble to hear the word of God. We have a beautiful conference center that is across the street from, Salt, from the Salt Lake City Temple. It seats 21,000 people and members of the church come from around the world to fellowship with one another and hear the words of God. But at each conference, street preachers of opposing religious views um, assemble and come to Salt Lake City outside of our conference center. Some of them are polite and desire to engage in rational conversation. However, many are provocative. They shout insults, engage in in-your-face confrontations, all while attempting to escalate conflict. Some of them carry signs accusing the people of my faith of everything, from being possessed of Satan to perhaps even using the wrong dinner fork for salads. So um, not long ago, one member of um, my church decided to do something that actually terrified him. He went up to one of the most vocal protesters and nervously asked him if he would like to go to lunch later in the week. The simple act of offering to spend time with an adversary changed both of their lives. They ended up becoming friends. Now when this street preacher comes to Salt Lake City twice a year to protest at General Conference, he stays at his Mormon friend's house. <laughs> so he prays with him and his family. The two of them have lengthy, honest, and sincere conversations about the realities of their doctrinal differences, but always show each other friendship and respect. So miracles happen. These two men exemplify an, an important lesson. The more we get to know those who are different from us, the more we learn that perhaps they are not so different from us after all. And the more we understand this, the more likely we are to set aside our distrust and dislike of others. Now, the second insight, we must speak up. We all have a responsibility to speak the truth, to stand for what is right, to lift up our voices in support of that which is good. Too often, evil rises in the world because good men and good women do not find the courage to speak against it. 
And sometimes terrible, preventable events happen because we fail to open our mouths. In January of 1990, 1990, Avianca Flight 52 approached New York City. 158 people were on board the Boeing 707, including several children under the age of two who were coming to the United States to be adopted. In a terrible tragedy, the plane crashed and 73 of the people on board lost their lives. Why did it crash? What caused this terrible tragedy? The short answer is that the plane ran out of fuel. Fog and wind conditions had caused inbound delays and airspace congestion. And so the plane circled in the holding pattern waiting for its turn to land. The crew reported to air traffic control that they were low on fuel but failed to communicate the seriousness of their situation. In addition, the cockpit crew was reluctant to question the judgment of the 51-year-old captain who had logged nearly 17,000 hours flying the Boeing 707. The captain and first officer, perhaps out of respect for the air traffic controllers on the ground, failed to demand the absolute need to get a short approach for landing. When one air traffic controller passed responsibility for the flight to another, he neglected to state the nature of the emergency. One person after another did not speak up clearly perhaps out of respect for others, or because of timidity, or because of neglect. And so, the engines of the 707 flamed out, and the airplane crashed into a Long Island hillside. Perhaps the most tragic thing about this event is that it could have been prevented if only someone would have had the courage to speak up for the truth forcefully and courageously. In a world where intolerance, meanness, and hatred are so easily accessible, especially with the communication means we have now, we do have a responsibility to speak up and defend what is good and right. We have all heard the profound statement attributed to Edmund Burke. The only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men and women to do nothing. This applies to us today. We have a responsibility to speak up for goodness, for virtue, for kindness and understanding. We have an obligation to defend the weak and stand up for the downtrodden. In this age, perhaps more than any other, since the beginning of time, we are exposed to bullies and braggarts, people who belittle others and preen themselves in prideful arrogance. We can and must stand and let our voices be heard. We don't need to be provocative or belittling, but we must not allow our fears to prevent us from lifting our voices in defense of what is right and good and true. I wonder how history might have been changed had the people of Germany spoken with one voice against the evil that rose around them. Perhaps future generations will ask the same of us today. It is not easy to stand in defense of what is right. We will likely face insult and ridicule. We will likely risk opposition and discomfort. Nevertheless, we must have the courage to do so. Now, the third insight, divine love is 
the answer. As I walked along the path of Auschwitz, I wondered if there was any hope. Was mankind destined to reenact the same tragedy over and over? Each generation writing its own verse and adding to the song of grief and sorrow of the ages? I so desperately wanted to hope it wasn't true that we learn from history that we cannot learn from history. The question that struck deep into my heart was, is there hope? I believe there is. I know there is. And what is that hope? Must we all believe the same creed, espouse the same political opinions, root for the same football team? No. That will never happen, even here at USC. <laughs> Nevertheless, there's one true virtue, one quality that could solve all the world's ills, cure all the hatred, and mend every wound. If we only learned to love God as our Father in heaven, this would give us purpose in life. If we only learn to love our fellow men as our brothers and sisters, this would give us compassion. After all, these are God's great commandments, to love God and to love our fellow men. If we distill religion down to its essence, we nearly always recognize that love is not merely the goal of religion, it is also the path of true discipleship. It is the destination. If we love as Christ loved, if we truly follow the path he practiced and preached, there's a chance for us to avoid the echoing tragedies of history and the seemingly unavoidable fatal flaws of man. Will compassion for others bring light into the darkness? Would it allow us to part the clouds and see clearly? Yes, for though we are all born blind, through the light of Christ we can see past darkness and illusion and understand things as they really are. My esteemed friends, my brothers and sisters, my brothers and sisters, I'm convinced that had my countrymen felt and applied the power of divine love and compassion, the Holocaust never could have happened. The evil that befell the world could have been prevented. Such heartache could not have descended upon the planet. It is easy to love those who wear the same color of jersey that we do. It is easy to forgive those who are like us. But what about those who are not on our team? What about those who hate us, who curse us? We are to love our enemies. Bless them that curse us, do good to them that hate us, and pray for them which despiteful use and persecute us. For as we do this, as we love our enemies, we truly begin to be worthy of our heritage as children of our Father, which is in heaven. We must love all of God's children because they are our brothers and sisters, as we are here, brothers and sisters. Even and perhaps especially, we must love those who are different and sometimes appear quite strange. This conviction and resolve to overcome our lower instincts and truly love all mankind, regardless of race, regardless of religion, regardless of political ideology and socioeconomic circumstances, is one of the grand objectives of our human existence. 
It is the essence of pure religion. It may not be an easy thing to do, but it is worth doing, and we can do it. My dear friends, I would like to end my remarks on the same note as I began. It truly is a joy and privilege to be among people who believe that we, the people of the world, have in common is of far greater significance than what divides us. Once again, I commend you for taking a significant step in this direction. We must try to really understand and to really know one another. We must raise our voices in defense of what is just and good. We must increase our genuine love for God, who is our Heavenly Father, and our fellow men, who are our brothers and sisters. This is our greatest hope of preventing the ever-repeating catastrophes that have plagued this planet since its earliest days. It is my hope that we will look past our differences and instead see each other with eyes that recognize who we truly are, fellow travelers, brothers and sisters, pilgrims, walking the same path that leads to becoming more enlightened and more refined as our Father in heaven intends us to become. Thank you, my friends. May God bless you all. Thank you so much.